You're listening to the Fan Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're talking about comic books. Here we go. Wonderful. Did you say that again, Josh? Because that was a great sentence. Uh, <laughs> let's talk big picture. Comics are wonderful. Perfect. Perfect way to start. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, Josh Pruitt, one of the guests on the Fan to Fan podcast. I'm Bernie Gonzalez, one of your hosts. With me today also, Pete Charbonneau, co-host extraordinaire, the man rocking the mustache that you can't see because this is an audio only <laughs> this is, podcast. This is a podcast mustache. Yes, it's visually embargoed. That's right. But Josh is seeing it. I'm seeing it. And also returning guest, frequent Fan to Fan podcast guest, guest extraordinaire, Michelle Brittany. Michelle, welcome to the Hello, podcast Michelle. yet again. Thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm I'm feeling like uh, I'm the fourth wheel. I don't have any facial hair to <laughs> match with everything. You could be else. the fourth wheel because then we have a car of mustaches. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I, I mean, theoretically. Theoretically. Theoret- yeah, theoretically. All right. <laughs> oh, wait. I have to pull over and go to the bathroom. <laughs> Is that, what kind of, what kind no. of hard road trip is this? We're not, we're not okay. there yet. We're not there oh, yet, Okay, Josh. okay. I, I have my beef jerky. Go ahead, Bernie. No, no this is good. because for ice cream. Oh, no, no. Are we there yet? Now I know okay. what parents feel like in the front seat. All right, guys, <laughs> keep it down. Keep it down. Uh, the two of you, lovely re- returning guests. We've talked about horror movies, movies like Phantasm. We've talked about Highlander. We've talked about Mystery Science Theater 3000. We've talked about Lovecraft. And you guys are certainly in the weeds in genre, writing, creating, developing, talking about all this stuff. And comics is kind of like part of our DNA. And that's kind of a, a, a part of who you are, right, Pete? Uh, yeah, no, I, I I have a feeling that the three of you are going to outpace me as far as like comic knowledge uh, and and um, just overall breadth. But um, yeah, I, I certainly, I mean, I was a red-blooded American child growing up, so I had you know, great memories of, you know, collecting random issues of Spider-Man, the Hulk. Uh, I did subscribe. I had a subscription to the Marvel, original Marvel Star Wars run. Nice. Uh, that's probably one of my favorite memories, I think, that I have just in general. Uh, someone gifted me the the subscription. And so I just remember going to the mailbox one day, opening the mailbox and seeing like the tan cover, slip cover for it having no idea what it was and just like pulling it open and seeing like, you know, the star Wars logo still remember the, the, the issue is like uh, Lando Luke and Chewie are trying to procure some rundown tie fighters or some like mission where they're going to you know try to infiltrate the empire. And I, you know, it, this is before the, the end, you know, the star Wars universe really kicked back into gear. The other than the films, there was nothing other than really like these Marvel comics. And so the stories that were told there just, opened up a, a just a whole new world and just I, I feel lucky that I think that was probably you know the original Marvel Star Wars best run was around that time the mm-hmm. only drawback was that Han Solo being my favorite character was frozen in carbonite at this point because this was post Empire so uh other than some flashbacks he did not appear very often so yeah so between that I, I got into X-Men for a little bit uh in the nice. 90s when you're looking for action, adventure, excitement, X marks the spot. It's Wolverine, Colossus, Dazzler, Nightcrawler, Storm. It's the most popular team in superhero history. Every month in Marvel Comics. Look for Marvel Comics where X marks the spot. I went back and did like a read read of like the old Tomb of Dracula and uh, Werewolf by Night. That was again like I. I had a couple of book and records when I was a kid and there was one for werewolf by night mm. that was a mashup of a couple of issues. And so like he fights Dracula at the end. And again, just what a, an amazing way to just get in a child's creativity and imagination was to, to experience those things. So, yeah, so I, I've, I've had a love of comics for, you know, for a long time. I don't collect anything currently, but I have a feeling that, you know, talking to you all, there may be a few uh, that will, be on my radar after this discussion so that that's my story as apropos to comics we can kind of share our origin stories and i think pete that's probably a story that's gonna be similar for a lot of folks because if you weren't if you didn't have like a big brother a cousin or someone Mm -hmm. who Mm -hmm. who shared comics with you or you know you were fortunate to maybe have a parent willing to throw in that comic as they were going to the grocery store, you know, that, that impulse buy, the Archie comic, you know, the things that make comic great 
were their accessibility, especially when they were filling in the gaps for something like Star Wars, like your story, right? Like you couldn't get a movie every week, every weekend. So the comics helped to fill in the gaps because you were a Star Wars fan, like you wanted more. And then if that hopefully sparked the interest to be like, oh, I want to check out other things in this format, in this in this medium, then maybe you had a newsstand, sometimes a gas station, a 7-Eleven, a Woolworth, that story, that, that Venn diagram of the kid that watches Universal Monsters, that loves Land of the Lost on Saturday mornings, watches Greatest American Hero. I'm pretty sure if you went back and you asked that that kid, they probably had a comic or two or a pile of comics in the corner of their room, X-Men 117 and maybe 302 and then Incredible Hulk. And it didn't matter. Maybe you weren't collecting them sequentially, but they scratched that itch to to be like, these are worlds that I want to visit and I'll, you know, I'll check them out when I can and how I can. Well, and, and before, Josh, before you jump in, uh, yeah. one, one of the things that I'm curious to hear from the three of you, because I know like some of the lengths that I went to to get comics when I was a kid. And that's and this is coming again from someone that like casually was a comic book reader, but just scrounging those spinner racks. And the closest comic shop to me was in uh, Lake Ronkonkoma, which is like a probably a 45 minute bike ride. Mm. And I would do it like on the weekends. I would take off. And again, this is before. GPS, I, I just I I had a look at a map to figure out where I was going and uh, and making those treks out there to yeah you know, to just like comb through the boxes and and find some of those gems. Uh, awesome memories of, of doing all of that. So I, I'm curious if if you all had similar experiences or even just what your experiences was were. Oh, you know? definitely. There's there's a beauty bit of the licensed comics. And I, I had my own version of that too, but there and, and this has worked for my kids. I've experienced this with my own kids. Is like it's connecting data. It's like you you know, you maybe wouldn't have gone out and, and bought a comic book, but someone was like, Oh yeah, Pete likes Star Wars. So I can they, they you know, here I'm gonna get this kid Pete. Uh, a Star Wars comic subscription. And so then it kind of opened up this whole, you know, universe, a whole medium of storytelling that you otherwise weren't exposed to. I think there's, uh, I had a similar experience with uh, the Dark Horse Alien books, like Alien vs. Predator. That was hugely formative for me. And I was I was too scared to kind of watch the movies. And and so that was like my in. And, and you know, those covers and those stories were hugely seminal. But yeah, it's like kind of what Bernie said, like the, the spinner rack at the 7-Eleven was like golden, like getting a Slurpee and a comic. And a graphic novel that uh, I just wrote and just came out called Last Comics on Earth uh, that we're going to be talking about on a different show. But I dedicated it to my mom because she she bought me my first comics off of a spinner rack at a 7-Eleven. Changed my life. It was like, mm -hmm. I think it was FF 315, <laughs> uh, Ben's going through a transformation. And then it was uh, one of the Marvel Book of the Dead, the Marvel Compendiums satanica and the red skull are on the cover so you had R, like, R through z <laughs> yeah it was something like that it was crazy pants but it just you know set my world on fire as a kid and i think i knew what comics were and i probably had read a handful but very much comic book stores were like you know finding the holy grail like mm -hmm. i remember i had maybe gone to one or two and they just seemed so unattainable and and like I remember going into one and they had like some turtles stuff and I was a huge fan of the TV show and had never seen the black and white turtles comics. And so seeing those real life was like mind blowing. And this was only at a comic shop. Like there was no way you were going to get unless it was the animated adaptation of, of the animated series in that style. You you wouldn't see uh, Eastman and Laird TMNT on a spinner rack. And so like that experience was so cool and so exotic. And I remember trying to convince my parents to take me to to take me to a comic shop. And we went there. The poor guy behind the counter was classic comic book guy. And, you know, the kind the kind of person that fits that cliche. And like my brother would not stop hassling me about it. Like my younger brother. And my mom had this thought of like, oh, gosh, if I buy my son these comic books, he's going to turn out like this. This not so healthy character kind of surly sitting behind this counter. Mm. And and like so it kind of it totally like eclipsed my comic book experience after that, where I couldn't talk them into it for a couple of years. But that was kind of my entrance was 7-Eleven spinner racks. When when they stopped doing that, like a little part of me died. And it was actually just before the or like at the onset of the pandemic where I bought my own. I bought my own spinner rack because that it was so 
formative. That experience was so formative to walk in there and just look at these comics and just like soak up all the worlds and characters. Yeah, that kicked it off for me. That kind of changed my trajectory. So, Michelle, I wanted to ask you because you've done comics journalism. Yeah, um, I have kind of entered the comics world a couple of times. Uh, My first time, I was probably about five or six, and I had reading comprehension issues. And so my grandmother, who was always there and supportive, she had tried books, and I just really... I know it's surprising. I didn't really like reading books when I was really young. And I, I think it was probably because I, I had trouble understanding what I was reading. And so, um, you know, we'd always go to grocery store. She'd see Casper and Richie Rich. Um, those were kind of my early uh, comic books that I read. And it was more out of my grandmother trying to get me to be interested in reading and to understand what I was reading. Mm. And um, so that's kind of how I first kind of touched into the world of comics. We're talking early 70s. There wasn't your your friendly, warm, inviting comic book shop down the street. It was going to the grocery store and whatever they had is what got picked up. And I, I don't really remember my grandmother buying too many of them. I think probably like maybe half a dozen. And then it wasn't until 30 years later, surprisingly, when I was um, at UW and I was the managing editor of our college newspaper, our university newspaper. I had just met Nick. I think he and I had been going out together for a while. He would read some comics. He had um, an interesting series called 100 Bullets. Mm-hmm. Um, Preacher. Mm-hmm. His roommates were reading Batman, all the superhero. All of a sudden, this world was starting to mm. become, I was becoming aware of this world of comics. I read, um, I think it was Batman, the Dark, the Dark Knight Returns. And then I was also reading Kingdom Come, my first four ways into comics as an adult. And that was probably right around 2005. You know, right away, I was already in the world of comics that was improved. And you could follow your writers and your mm-hmm. artists and things like that. Um, so, you know, those were two of the, the series that I read first. Um, I read Preacher. Yeah, after that, I went to a comic book store um, that wasn't too far from me. I was looking at all the shelves of all the new comics, and I was trying to find a comic that was the number one issue, you know, something that was the first issue and that's all there was. So that way I could pick up on a series that was brand new. Oh, cool. I came across Warren Ellis and Ben Temple Smith's fell. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. is what really, really hooked me and kind of took me off in a, in a different direction. I wasn't ever all that attracted to superhero comics. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely more interested in, um, independent and foreign. And part of that is through, I think, the fact that my trajectory took off into from consumer to actually being a critical anal- you know, analyst of comics. But then also, I was uh, looking at previews. Um, I got into looking at previews every month and really scouring through the 400 pages <laughs> to look and see what sounded interesting, what did I think would be a series that I'd want to read or one shot or whatever. That's kind of an overwhelming yeah. experience, huh? Yeah. And so that really got me into a lot of the other comic book titles that weren't as popular. They weren't as mainstream. And then also uh, we ended up setting, settling down at one comic book place uh, because we moved to a place where I think it was like less than a mile. And there was a comic book shop and the fellow there uh, it was spy comics and the, the owner was uh, Richard Spychansky, I think is his last name. Always had trouble with his last name. But because of his interest in kind of non-mainstream, he helped to really curate my experience. Mm. Um, and I think that was really important for my growth into comics. Um, and that just kind of set off a 15-year journey. That issue one, was it felt, I said, uh, the comic that... It was Fell. Fell, yeah. 
Yeah. What, was, was it was it the cover? Did you like kind of leaf through it? What was it about that particular one that that drew your interest? Uh, it was the art. Uh, so what mm. was interesting about the covers? It was mostly white, and then you just yes. had one panel box, right, with the Ben Temple Smith art. And I think uh, Fell, the the detective Fell, was on the cover, and he had this unusual emblem on his neck. Yeah, right. That stood out as kind of red with all mm-hmm. the sepia browns and grunge. And um, as a person that really loves art and history and, you know, just follows the real visual, um, it just struck me as so striking. And it was so different because when you look at all the racks uh, and all the, the covers of the comics, and that stood out so different from everything else. Because this, of course, is back when Ben Temple Smith was just taking off before others were actually kind of emulating his style. Mm-hmm. It was totally unique. And yeah, it was it was the cover. Which is what gets a lot of folks. I mean, that's uh, yep. the, the story that you guys all said. There's this inflection point for everyone. Pete, like you have someone who knows that you like Star Wars and then they subscribe you to a Star Wars comic, right? But did you seek out the X-Men when in the 90s? I did, yeah. I want to say that I, I had somehow picked up a random comic at some point. Yeah, it, it might have been from the grocery store. And you know, like a lot of people started becoming a little bit enamored with Wolverine. I thought, you know, kind of graduated from Spider-Man to, to Wolverine. And so I was like, all right, well, this, you know, this seems like a, a pretty cool um you know, one to get into because mm-hmm. again, like I wasn't huge into uh, superhero comics. I I'd get like one offs here and there. I have like a random Batman comic. I'd have a random Spider-Man Hulk, things like that. And I think I, I got into the X-Men right about uh, it wasn't secret invasion, but it was the um, I'm blanking on the, their secret their wars. Was it Phoenix secret wars scrolls, scrolls. scrolls. Can you picture artists or writer? The Morlocks. Morlocks. Oh, thank you. Yep. So it was it was kind of around that run. I uh, I had suffered a ruptured appendix around that time and uh, was in the hospital laid up for for two weeks, which was supposed to be, you know, like a, a, a short procedure uh, ended up being kind of a miserable, miserable time of my life when I was in college. Oh, yeah. And having a stack of X-Men comics was really, um, you know, I won't say it was literally a lifesaver, but, but you know, for all mentally, purposes, emotionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. To, and to have those handy uh, as you know as an escape for you know 15 20 minutes however long it took to read an issue that was that was huge for me if you're looking for adventure this summer escape with marvel comics fight crime with spider-man meet the fantastic four and watch captain america in action May the Force be with you as you battle the evil empire in Star Wars. Discover the secrets of the South American jungle in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And with Marvel Comics, you're never alone because they can go with you in the car or to the park, even on a rainy day. Marvel Comics are your ticket to fun and adventure this summer. From Michelle, your grandmother giving you an Archie comic. Josh, your mom having you at the store and buying you the comic that was there, what was available yes. for Whatever you, was for available. her, right? Yep. Yep. To yep. then, yep. The, like that next inflection point where you actually start looking for the thing that scratches yep. your itch. And in your case, right. Michelle, like, all right, well, you have this love for horror and genre, and then you see something like Fell with Ben Temple Smith's art. And then like you mentioned, some of the vertical titles like preacher that, that were gaining your interest less of the typical superhero fair mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. dominates so much of, of comics where people almost mistake that it's a genre, not the format that yeah, capes right. is not everything. It's just part of right. the thing, but that feels like that's that moment. I think for a lot of us where like Josh, like you said, once you go to the comic shop, you see that there are more options. So now what are you into? Because very likely when you go from the five things available on the spinner rack to the 5,000 things available on the shelf in long boxes, the aperture opens up and you're like, wow, what else is here that I like? And hopefully if you have someone that's willing to kind of guide you through that um, and not be the stereotypical comic book guy at the shop, that might be a little little, uh, difficult to, to maneuver with when you're just like, I don't know. And I just need some help. And if you're willing yeah, to help me. Yeah, and I just me, need some help, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the best the best comic shop owners and, and workers are are of the uh, Super Hill family of librarians who can recommend and put the right comic in the right young or older person's hand. And, yep. 
And I want right. to connect that to that dot that Michelle, you threw out there with previews. So because for folks that are not familiar, and Pete, I mean, if you're not familiar with are you have you ever heard of the previews book? Uh no, I don't believe no. I have. So the previews book is basically like a monthly yellow pages that's released by the comic book industry that is printed on newsprint. So it has a lot of the aesthetic qualities of a yellow pages as we remember it. Maybe folks who are listening may be like, what is this thing you speak of? But it was a resource that was available. A lot of homes had it. You used mm-hmm. it to reach things on top of shelves that were a little too high or to call people when you needed plumbers and such. But in the comics industry, you get this thing printed out every month and Proves the point. It's a newspaper. It's newspaper print because it's cheap to produce because you have to do it so often. Why? Because there are a shit ton of comics <laughs> released. So if you're just like, hey, I'm here. What is there for me to find? It's like there are so many options, so many pages to flip through. It can be incredibly overwhelming. And yeah. you, you almost have to like be willing to do some of the work on your own to be like, I know there's something out here that I'm going to like. I just have to find it. And for sure, it, you know, you, you once you find it, it seems like, you know, you're in for life. Absolutely. Well, Bernie, what was kind of your experience? Mine was kind of a hybrid of Pete's and, and yours and, and a little bit of, of Michelle's as well, because I remember growing up G.I. Joe comics. I mean, but I mean, it's kind of like the talk about connecting dots. The toys are out there The you know, mm-hmm. I'm breaking every th- uh, thumb and crotch that I can possibly get my hands on with the G.I. <laughs> Joe figures. There's no uh, rubber band that that I haven't worn down to bits, <laughs> except Snake Eyes, because, you know, he's, he's Snake Eyes. So you, you don't mess with his thumbs and his crotch. Uh, a sentence that you can absolutely take out of context, by all means, please do. <laughs> but, you know, for for, you know, parents who are like, hey, he likes this, so we will get him that. So mm-hmm. at a Kmart, at a Woolworth, at a Walgreens, they would be like, okay, well, here's issue 27 of G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe is counterattacking. Our Rattler will slow them down. It's G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro fighting to save the day. They're destroying our tanks. Get the hovercraft. Joe never gives up. He's always there. Fighting for freedom over land and air. G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe is there. They're beating us. We better call Zartan. What can he do? Find out in the adventures of G.I. Joe from Marvel Comics. Similar to what you guys, you know, what's available. Yeah. That's what I got. And yeah. then at one point, I remember it distinctly, kind of like that Fantastic Four you mentioned, Josh. It was Infinity Gauntlet number one because it was like a magnet. And I see a Hulk and I see a Spider-Man and I see a Captain America. And I don't, don't I know I don't have a lot of money, but... I know all these characters that I have variations of underoos about um, are in the co- on the cover of this comic. So I feel like I'm going to get my money's worth. And there you go. It looks pretty cool. Like it looks action packed. So that checked a lot of boxes when I mm-hmm. could start saying, no, this isn't the issue I was given. This is the issue I'm going to pick. And mm-hmm. then when you go into the back of those pages, same thing like those Star Wars comics, Pete, that you got, you start seeing, wait, this Marvel comics makes other things and I could subscribe to other uh, series. And then that started opening the door for me to realize, well, this is cool. Now I want to find out what Captain America does. And okay, well, where do I get these things? Oh, they're at comic shops. And eventually 90s comics boom. We go from like that black and white explosion that Turtles like, you know, was a big part of like you were talking about, Josh. For sure. You know, you go from black and white uh, Laird Eastman to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by Archie's, uh, you yes. know, and right. they're very different at every yeah. Walgreens. Very different, but closer to the series that we closer grew up to the watching. series that we watched. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you go to a comic shop and you're like, "What is this black and white turtles thing? Wow, this is not what I'm used to." But I'm willing mm-hmm. to check this out. And mm-hmm. then when you read it, you realize much more mature in tone, and it's inspired by something called a Daredevil and by this guy named Frank Miller. And then yeah, kind of right. <laughs> You you kind of close the loop on you know on Dark Knight Returns because then you you start seeing these seminal works and you realize that comics are more than Archie. Comics are more than the few things that just happen to be there when you were checking out at the grocery store. DC, incredible action, astonishing adventures, the coolest heroes, the hottest heroines. And the most outrageous film for TV in the universe. These ain't your daddy's comic books, fanboy. The DC Comics. Get your DC Comics at Merlin's Downtown or Gorilla Bob's on the North Side. Yeah, and one thing, another thing that I'm curious about, certainly Josh, Bernie, and myself, 
our introduction and inflection point were through like, you know, IP. So like Star Wars, Ninja Turtles, mm-hmm. G.I. Joe. Mm-hmm. Like that's how we got in. Like, Michelle, you did a little more searching on your own to find that, you know, that first comic that was going to speak to you or that you were interested in in, in reading and learning more about. Um, but I'm curious for, for all of you, like what, at what point do you make that jump from, okay, like I'm, I'm a Star Wars fan to, yeah, discovering who, you know, certain artists are. And then you, you mm. can almost kind of start, I don't know if you change, may, maybe you do, but maybe it's more like a, like parallel lines of like following a comic that you really like, but then also like really being turned on by certain artists and like, okay, well, what they're doing here is super interesting. So I'm going to follow them as they go from book to book to book. So I'm curious mm-hmm. you know, how that worked for, for the three of you. You know, because I started with Fell um, and I really like Ben Temple Smith's I started looking at what else he was doing, and that actually led me to um, Steve Niles and 30 Days of Night. Oh, yeah. I ended up following Steve Niles and Ben Templesmith quite a bit. You know, more than IPs, I think I followed actual individuals. Um, Mm -hmm. But definitely, I can see connections. Ben Templesmith was the jumping off point that led me to Steve Niles, that led me to Bernie Wrightson, that led me Mm. on to other to other uh, writers and artists. I would also say that I took a real interest in the publishers. So mm-hmm. again, um, I kind of shied away from DC and Marvel and went more towards Dark Horse and mm-hmm. uh, Magnetic mm-hmm. Press, which is more recent. I, I'm going to not pronounce them right. But it's A-R-C-H-A-I-A. I don't Archaea? Know I found Archaea. Archaea. Yeah. Um, and so I started following publishers. Archaea ran a series called The Killer, mid-2000s. Um, and I think it was a French story following an assassin that had mm. been translated into English. I think my, I don't think I've really changed that much from that. Um, hmm. I follow particular people or it leads me to something. Um, but I will definitely see that, you know, certain genres like spy genres. So I got into Ed Brubaker, uh, Joelle uh, Jones, who did Lady Killer. So good. Yeah. You know, those are the femme, femme fatale, you know, all of Ed Brubaker's stuff. I've, I've followed Steve, um, Steve Niles again, um, particularly criminal macabre. I guess I'm really a lot into mystery and a lot into horror, which mm-hmm. makes sense. What about you, Bern? As as a comics artist, the art always spoke to me. The, not that the writing I was uninterested in the in in the writers or the writing, but the the art had to do the the sale. Like once once the yes. the art had me, like I, I was in. And similar to Michelle, what you were saying, like once I found an artist that I loved, and mind you, like I am a byproduct of the '90s explosion. So Jim Lee, Sylvestri, McFarlane, uh, Liefeld. All of these artists that made seismic changes in mm-hmm. your expectation as a teenager for what comics look like. Those folks allowed me to see more comics, but then also then realize like, okay, well, what influenced you guys? Because I see uh, this guy named Art Adams that seems to be a little bit in Jim Lee's work, and I'm going to check yeah. out more of this guy's work, but. It seems like they were influenced by Jack Kirby and, ooh, I don't like it. It's too boxy and it's old. But then eventually you start realizing, oh, wait, like this is amazing. And now I I learned to appreciate it. So I I certainly followed the artist more than the writers because – and I think especially in my end where I like to approach characters less for like the canon and the crossovers – and I like to just find good interpretations of those characters mentioning like Dark Knight Returns, right? Like that's a seminal work. Like, you know, if there's a Mount Rushmore of comics, it's up there with works like Watchmen, right? But it's kind of a out of canon Elseworlds to use the DC word, right? Interpretation of Batman. It's probably not the Batman that was on. Well, I hope not. That would be a really grim version of uh, a pair of underoos that you would have that would have like a, a Frank Miller. <laughs> Remember with the little crackly booties that you would have? Mm-hmm. That would be mm-hmm. one piece. Yes. I don't think <laughs> that's not the version we had, but I'm more attracted to like evergreen interpretations of characters. So that's why when I saw artists like Darwin Cook that were inspired by Archie comics, 
inspired by mid-century style, retro style, but felt like this is a version of a character like Flash or Green Lantern. Like, I don't want to know their whole history. I just I just want to see like a good story. That was kind of like the motivation for like my my trips to the comic shop. Like you discover someone like Sam Keith or a Bill Senkevich. That, that started to kind of scratch my ish, itch to be like, well, it'd be fun to be an artist, but I think I'm looking for less comic book art and I'm looking for a, a different level of artistry and design in my comics as well. What about you, Josh? Yeah, my, my path was similar. It was artist first, like looking at covers and being like, oh, what is that? And who are those characters and stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, so early on, it was like it was Ghost Rider, early 90s Ghost Rider, Howard mm-hmm. Mackey, Javier Salteras and Mark Texera, which... Their take on Ghost Rider is like my favorite, like of all time. Um, and then, you know, it was the X books, right? It was X Men, X Force, New Mutants. Uh, but I didn't know. So, for instance, so like I have this very strong memory of like my parents, I went, you know, having to go to Costco with my parents and I can talk them into buying this th- comic three pack. Ooh, the three packs. Like New Mutants oh, three pack. 100 yeah. or 99 or whatever when Liefeld was ushering the book into X Force. And like that's why I picked it up. But inside was a Walter Simonson written and drawn uh, Fantastic Four, which is mm. now a piece of some of my. It was like Walt drawing dinosaurs, which is his favorite thing in the world. Literally, his signature is in the shape of Brontosaurus. For those who yes. don't know, yes. Um, but like doing the FF on an island that's slowly shrinking, it, like it kind of blew my mind. So then it was like you know it's following these artists, and then as Bernie said, it's like. It's that image explosion, picking up Savage Dragon and Youngblood and Spawn and waiting in line at Comic-Con, you know, in 92 to get McFarlane to sign my Spawn number one. Comics were everything. And I was certainly reading Wizard Magazine and I was like learning about rights issues that I knew nothing about, just Mm -hmm. getting a sense of it. You know, at the same time, it was like developing my tastes too. Mignola doing like a cover or a fill-in on X-Force and X-Men and being like, this isn't Jim Lee. And, like, me not being into it. And then, uh, like, same thing with Sam Keith. Like, Keith dropping in and doing a Ghost Rider or this or that. And being like, oh, this is too esoteric for me. I don't get it. Or, like, mm-hmm. looking at the Kirby stuff and being like, yeah, I don't really understand. I love the Fantastic Four. But, like, that approach artistically, I'm you know, it, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. And then educating myself as, like, a young art major. Being like, oh, my God, this is the best stuff ever. And for me, it really pivoted when Hellboy came out. My dad bought like the first issues of that for me. And there's backups uh, by Art Adams. And though I had seen his work on the FF some time back, he did like some fill-ins on that and X Factor, etc. But like Monkey Man and O'Brien is like one of my favorite comic book creations of all time. And like Art Adams, I think is him and Walt Simonson and Mignola are like kind of my triumvirate. Jim Lee is still one of the finest draftsman people we've ever had in comic books for my money. Um, and his X-Men stuff, I think, has yet to be touched in, in any way, shape, or form. That X-Men 1 through 3 that relaunched. Those artists in particular, like kind of educating myself, learning about comic book art, starting to appreciate Kirby a little bit more. But like Monkey Man and O'Brien and Hellboy, Simonson run on Fantastic Four, and Simonson doing Robocop versus Terminator. Mm. That's when it all really took off for me as being like, man, I I think I want to do comics or I want to draw for a living or I want to, you know, and we've talked on here about, you know, wanting to be a concept designer and me wanting to get into storyboarding. But like visual storytelling in comics and and, I, you know, I didn't get into the writers until much later. Yeah, like that kind of the artistic renaissance of the 90s that image really kicked off and kind of inspired another group of folks to also go independent. Like, as Bernie said, like, that was a seismic a change in kind of the history of comics. And to kind of be at the cusp of that, you know, going into a shop and them having all those issues, man, it was a heady time. It was a blast. Mm-hmm. It was a blast. I have really fond memories of that. Remember, you can find the Fan to Fan podcast at www.fanpodcast.com. Facebook, just search Fan to Fan podcast. That's F A N, the number two, F A N, on Instagram at Fan to Fan Podcast, or on Twitter at Fan to Fan Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so send a message and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. 
And now, on with the show. You mentioned history of comics. We celebrate like the history of cinema, the history of art, I think in a different way than we celebrate the history of comics. Comics has had to crawl its way from being something disposable, literally made on paper that was me- meant to be disposable pulp disposable. paper yeah. because it's not meant to be collected. It's literally meant to be rolled up in a kid's back pocket and you're meant to move on. You're not supposed to put it on a bag and board. And it's really in our lifetimes, the hindsight is much more, is better for us because now we mm-hmm. see that there is a history. Like you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, rights issues, Josh. Like yeah. that's something that became a spotlight when we bought things like Spawn Number One and Young Blood. And I'm like, why are all these things dedicated to Jack Kirby? Who is right. this guy that they're all celebrating? And then you find out about him, inevitably part of the, the muddled history, you find out about rights and being screwed over. And because it is such a small field, you realize that, it hasn't had a lot of the glory that that cinema has, right? Like mm-hmm. where we don't necessarily see a Jack Kirby in the same way that we might see like a Kubrick or a Scorsese. And I and I say this more for someone who's listening who's like, well, I don't understand comics. And I'm like, no, but I bet you do because if you like movies, if you like music, it's actually not that different. Like the way yeah. we've discovered yeah. this medium. So I, I always kind of share the story. My buddy gave me a copy of Hard Boiled, which introduced me to John Woo. Mm-hmm. And- then I had to check out more John Woo, and he mentioned Sam Peckinpah. So then I watched The Wild Bunch. And yeah. then in watching this, The Wild Bunch, I see other spaghetti westerns, Sergio Leone, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And he mentioned some some guy named John Ford and Howard Hawks. So then I see The Searchers. So I can track it where I'm like, I only saw The Searchers or Stagecoach with John Wayne, movies that were my father's movies, mm-hmm. because I saw John Woo's The Killer in Hard Boiled. But I bet there's a band that you've listened to or a movie that you've watched. And for whatever reason, I like this band. I want to find out more about them. And you find out that some of their members were in another band or that there's another side project they had. And then you just start going down that rabbit hole. Comics are not that different where you discover one artist, one writer, one title, and you'll always find something that'll scratch that itch and will cause new itches. Well, yeah, and I think that uh, uh, comics, the beauty part about comics, and that's what's so, so interesting to me about everyone's entry, point of entry, is like Michelle came in at a time where there was a renaissance for adult storytelling in comic books. And like all of these things have these wonderful cycles. And so it's like in the 80s, it's like there was like punk rock and 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 mm. was, was a huge influence. Punk rock mm-hmm. and horror was a huge influence on comics. And like the direction of the artwork and the direction, like the indie scene coming up in the 80s, right, was different, right? So there's always these kind of fun in, in, uh, indie scenes. Or like even when you're talking about Kirby, you're talking about like somebody who's creating comics before and after World War II. And like there's this wonderful legacy. And like I think one of the things that's really fascinating when you start digging into this stuff, it's so prominent in pop culture there's a generation of kids who don't understand that it wasn't Mm -hmm. that, you know, for instance, comic book movies were like a joke. Like people were like pointing at movies and being like, well, that looks like crap. Like comics must be terrible. And like, now it's like people who know comics like that, that's a much bigger part of popular culture than it's ever been. And, And then when, when you start going back and doing that research and realizing that so much of the Marvel movies and those, those, those giant successes came from like, Three or four people working in the 70s, a blue collar, comic book pencilers and inkers and writers just doing their job. That's the kind of the joy, I think, of comics is like being able to go back and dig in and kind of what you're saying, Bernie, is like seeing these connections and inspiration points and being like, oh, yeah, you know, like Walt Simonson was a paleontologist major Mm. because he just he loved that stuff. And then, you know, he came to this other thing later. Getting into those personalities and those quirky stories and unpacking them and then finding those artistic and written sensibilities that appeal to you. 